22, verses 17 through 20 here. We see the Lord's Supper. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that we have to gather together this evening, the opportunity to remember what you've done for us, how you died on the cross and paid for our sins, the blood that was shed, your, your body that was given for us, Lord. I pray you'd help us never to take it for granted. Lord, I pray you'd help us not to gloss over it. I pray you'd help us never to take it lightly. Lord, as we look at this Lord's Supper this evening, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray you would strengthen us, encourage us. I pray you would give us Give us what we need from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we look at this passage here, the, the Lord's Supper, um, as it's called, the Lord's Table by some, whatever. We're looking at this passage where Jesus is with his disciples. And today, <clears throat> yes, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Excuse me, in just a minute. But before we do, I wanted to look at the nature of what Jesus said as he's going through this, as he's laying this out to them. And we understand the actions. We understand the sentiment. There's been so much that's said about this that I'm not going to say anything new that most of us have not heard this evening. But I want to look at what Jesus was teaching his disciples, what he was laying out as he had this Lord's Supper with them. So first of all, we're going to look at some of the, the goals and him himself as we you know see his speech here. The first thing we see, I notice at least in verse 17, it says, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourself, selves. I think it's interesting and it's obvious because we've seen it done before, but the Lord's Supper was not an individual exercise. This is not something that you go home and do on your own. This is not something that you, you know, go to the, the you know, fast food place and you say, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. No, no, no. This is an exercise where they, they came together. It was something that was shared among the brethren. It was something that strengthened their bonds. And the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, is something that is intended to bring God's people together. Now, I think we can all understand that food is something that can bring God's people together. You know, there's not much that you know promotes or or brings out fellowship than food. You know, if you want to get together with someone, sometimes it can be kind of awkward and you just be like, hey, I need to talk to you, Brother Jordan. Oh no, you know, what, what's going on? You know, am I in trouble with pastor? But you say, hey, Brother George, let's get together for lunch. And, you know, hey, there's a different spirit. There's, there's a communion. There's a, a fellowship that goes on there. There's a strengthening of those brotherly bonds. But yet at the same time, he gave them this bread and he says, take this and divide it among yourselves. And I hope you can picture this. I don't know about you, but dividing food can sometimes be a, let's just say a divisive matter. I don't know. When I grew up, and, and it wasn't like we didn't have food in the house, but my brothers and I, we we didn't like to see our our brother have a larger portion of food than than I had. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that I had the biggest piece of pie. Not necessarily when it came to spinach or you know mushrooms or the things I didn't like, but you know when it came to the things that I wanted, I wanted to make sure that my brother didn't have a bigger portion than I did. And, and it's interesting that you know Jesus at this time where it brings them together over a meal. He gives them the bread and says, take this and divide it among yourselves. I could just imagine, you know, some of these disciples, you know, is he taking more of the bread than I am? You know, is, is he getting more? When I was a kid, I don't know how many of you have ever done the you split, I pick. You ever do that before? Yeah, maybe it's just because it's in our family. But whoever splits it doesn't choose it. They're the last to pick. So, you know, if there's two of you, you know, you split it in half and the other person then chooses. So they have the option, if they're uneven, to take the one that's larger. You can take notes here. This is good stuff, you know. <laughs> Practical, helpful. You know, but same thing if there's a group or whatnot. I don't know how they did this here, but they split it up. And here Jesus tells his disciples, divide it among yourselves. Above all, this was a shared experience. It was a shared time of remembrance. And we see that in the Lord's Supper, there is communion. 
That's what's in your notes there. There is communion. There is a shared experience. There is a shared time of remembrance. And our remembrance of the redeeming work of Christ ought to bring unity and fellowship in the church. How sad it is to read about what happened in the Corinthian church when the Lord's Supper was uh, done improperly and how it was something that divided up the church because that goes against the intent and what Christ was trying to do. As we look at what Christ did, it ought to bring humility. It ought to be something that brings us closer together. How can I look at what Christ did on the cross? Think about the blood that he shed. Think about his body that was broken. Think about what he went through and it not bring humility in my own heart and life. I mean, if you, if you don't come away from the Lord's Supper with humility, you're doing it wrong. You're not considering what we're supposed to consider and what we're supposed to remember. And that humility can only strengthen my relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible tells us in Hebrew or in Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh, what? Contention. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. And I'll tell you what, if we have a church where we keep a humble heart, there's not going to be contention. There's not going to be infighting. There's not going to be gossiping and politics and people trying to jockey to do something. And I don't believe it's here, but I'll say, I'll mention it. Hey, be careful. Satan tries to get a foot in the church in the simplest of ways. Don't let pride lift us up and cause contention here in this church. And as we remember the Lord's Supper, as we remember the work of Christ, and there's a humility that ought to bring us together as a church. It's impossible to look at what Christ went through on the cross and come away with pride. You know, when you remember that it was, it was my sin that put nails in his hands, right? I mean, it's easy to think about the, the person out there, the drug addict, the person who's a murderer, those other people. Hey, it was my sins. It was the things that I did that nailed him to that tree. It was my sins that his blood was shed for, that his bodily was, body was mutilated for, that his body was broken for. And, and, and by the way, I, I can't believe that they keep stealing my seat every Sunday morning. No, no. Those two things, they just, they don't go together. They just don't. If you consider what Christ has done, it humbles us and we're not going to come away arguing in, in those ways. The Lord's Supper is something that brings God's people together. And so the question is, how is my communion with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Will I let this, what I'm doing this evening, draw me closer together? Hey, I hope that as I've announced it several weeks in advance, the, the reason is not just because, you know, we're going to invite visitors. That, that's not what we're announcing it for. The reason we're announcing the Lord's Supper is so that we can prepare our hearts, so that we can come to church and be ready. And I hope that if there's a person here that maybe you struggle with, maybe a person that has you know wronged you in some way, I don't know what it is, but I know that those things pop up in a church. You're not going to you're not going to have a church that doesn't have those things pop up. Make it right. Get those things right. Let this time be a time that brings us together as a church. So we see first of all the Lord's Supper was an opportunity for communion for the brethren to be drawn closer together. The second thing that we see here in this passage, or at least that I see in this, is in verse 18. It says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. How many of you have a, a red letter Bible? Red letter Bible. Yeah, I know of a, a church that, I'm sorry, a church, a ministry uh, that does translation work over in, in the UK. And when they translate the word of God, they're very particular about the words of God. They want it to be exactly, and they will not print any red letter Bibles because they believe it puts undue emphasis on some words as opposed to others. And I appreciate the way that they, you know, take it so seriously. I'll tell you what, the translation work that they did into Nepali, you know, from the, you know, script, they, they, they did an excellent job. I appreciate their stance on the King James Bible and they will not allow their foreign translations that they have, you know, done to be put even in a Bible app at the same time alongside other you know, non-King James Version, you know, English translations. So they're very serious about the words of God. But as you look at this, you'll see that, you know, if you have that red letter Bible, this is Jesus talking here. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. We see here some commitment. We see commitment in the Lord's Supper and this speech and what he was telling his disciples was an opportunity for Christ to show his commitment to his work on the cross. 
It was his opportunity to show his commitment essentially to us. And we know from Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, it says, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I'll tell you what, when Christ was taking the, the Lord's Supper and, and remembering, or I guess looking forward to what he was doing at that point, this was an opportunity for him to show his commitment to us. I'll tell you, in our society today, we lack commitment. It's evidence in so many different ways, but people don't want to commit in their relationships. You see marriages that break up and break up, and, and nowadays it's gotten to the point where you can't even rely on marriage, certific or marriage statistics because so many people refuse to even get married. They're just in a relationship and they break up, and they're in a relationship and they break up. There is no commitment in these ways. You look at, you look at jobs and the way that people bounce around from job to job to job to job nowadays, and I understand there are places that mistreat you know, they're employees. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I am not saying you stay at a place where you're being mistreated, that's wrong, et cetera. There are reasons you leave a job. Use, use common sense. That being said, there are people that just get tired of the scenery. They get tired of the landscape. They get tired of working with the same people. And it isn't long before they just move on somewhere else. And they bounce and they bounce and they bounce. I, I read this uh, maybe last year that Burger King pays their uh, employees or they had an option to pay their employees every single day. There was a direct deposit every day, and it was because they had such turnover. They had people that were coming, and they'd work just a little bit, and they'd be gone. And because of that, every single day, they would have a direct deposit into their bank account through their pay because it was just so so transient. And I'll tell you, I don't have to sit up here and tell you about the lack of commitment in our society. You know, we see it in church attendance. We see it in all sorts of ways. We, I'll knock on doors and talk to folks, and, and they'll say, I'm a... Um, I, I go to this church and I'll tell them, hey, it's hard to find people nowadays that are faithfully attending church at all. Now, I don't know if they're faithfully attending, but I tell them it's hard to find people that are you know, in church anywhere at all. And I'll try and inquire and ask about that because commitment is an unusual thing. But here we see Jesus Christ, he demonstrates his commitment for them. He says, hey, I am not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He says, there are some things that I'm not going to do until this has come. He did not come back to earth and then, you know, Jesus was the perfect example of his commitment. He didn't come to earth and then back away from his purpose. I'll tell you what, if it was me and I came down to earth from heaven and, and I don't want to presume and don't, don't read into this or anything, but I was, if I was in his place, there would be some things that I would, I would have a hard time following through on. They would be. Those are some difficult, some heavy things. We see his prayer in the garden. We see how, how difficult it is, but he was committed and he finished through and he did not back away from his purpose. There's a story about Farmer Brown and uh, the animals that were determined to celebrate his birthday. Have you heard about this, Caleb? You heard about Farmer Brown? No. And uh, the chicken said, hey, let's put together a wonderful birthday breakfast for Farmer Brown. So this chicken said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lay an egg, and we're going to use this egg. It's going to make a great breakfast for him. What, what are you going to go ahead and, and do? And this cow says, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and give some milk that we can use in his breakfast. He's going to, he's going to enjoy this. This is going to be a, a good breakfast. And they both turned to the pig, and they said, why, why don't you get involved? Why don't you give him some bacon? And the pig looked back at him, and he said, hey, for you, it's involvement. For me, it's complete commitment. For me, it's complete commitment, and you, you understand why that cow, he's not giving any you know, beef or anything. I, I don't know, but you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, we need some commitment when it comes to the things of God. You know, I, I'm, the Bible talks about us giving our lives, and when Jesus Christ came to earth, he didn't just give a little of himself. He didn't just come to, to be a help and guide morally, and you'll talk to people that believe that, but that's not what we see in the scriptures. That's not why he came. He didn't come just to, to heal and to feed the needy. It was complete commitment. He came to give his life. And without the shedding of blood, the blood of the perfect Lamb of God, there is no remission of sins. And Jesus showed us his commitment in this speech to his disciples at the Lord's Supper. He was going to deny his flesh till the fulfillment of his work on the cross. And that's just the beginning. He's made many commitments to us. We saw it today 
in the message we talked about the things that he's committed the things that uh the promises that he's made several of those hebrews 13 5 says let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he has said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee and he showed us his commitment he shows it to us over and over and over again but we see it here in this speech before the lord's supper and the question then is what is our commitment like in return to him I'm not talking about commitment to your employer. I, I talked about commitment in general, but that's not what I'm talking about here tonight. I'm not talking about commitment to you know your spouse. I'm talking about commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is your commitment to what he calls you to do? And I'll tell you, when you are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and you've given your life to him and you're not holding back anything else, it'll change your commitment in other areas too. I'll tell you, a person who's committed to Christ is committed to their husband. A person who is committed to Christ is committed to their wife. A person who is committed to Christ is committed to the church that they're a member and a part of. A person who is committed to Christ is committed to serving and working in their workplace and giving their best to their employers. A person that is committed to Christ, it will show in other areas of their lives. But tonight, the question is, are we committed followers of Christ or are there boundaries that we've set? And I'll tell you, sometimes you don't, I don't know about you, but I've never sat down and said, you know, Lord, here's a list of the boundaries. Just don't take it too far in this area over here or, or this here too. You know, no, no, we don't make lists, or at least I hope you don't, please. I don't want to open up any of your Bibles and find a list of boundaries and limitations that you've given God. That, that, that would make me very, very sad. But there are some things that in our minds, we sometimes put up little fences, little areas where, you know, it's just, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to go there. I hope the preacher doesn't delve into that area. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't know what that is. Sometimes I, I try to list. I want to give practical examples of areas where, you know, the Lord can work in your heart and say, this is what I'm talking about. So you don't just wonder, you know, what is the preacher talking about when he says, you know, commitment to Christ. But there are times where sometimes I just need to step back as a preacher and say, hey, let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. There is some area that the Lord is dealing with your heart in, I don't know what it is. I don't know what area you may be dealing with, what area the Lord is working your heart in, and just say, hey, Lord, examine me, show me. Is there an area in my heart, in my life, that I have blocked off, that I am not fully committed? Are we committed followers of Christ? The Lord's Supper here was an opportunity, we see, for the brethren to be drawn closer together, communion. We see it was an opportunity for Jesus to show us his commitment. The last thing we see here, verse 19, at least the last we'll look at this evening. It says, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus was using this time together to teach the disciples. He was telling them what he was doing. He was explaining it. He was giving his body, and more than just giving his body, he was telling the disciples why and, and how this was working. There was some, some commentary here. That's the C word that you can put in your notes. There was not just communion, not just commitment, but there was some commentary and explanation of what was happening. And this wasn't the first time that Jesus had told them what was happening. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 and 22 says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So, hey, this is no surprise to them. This is something he's laid out before. It was something that they fully understood. It wasn't something that slipped over their heads. Verse 22 in that same passage, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. So he understood it. He heard Jesus. He knew what he was saying. And I'm not even going to get into rebuking Jesus and, and all that. But hey, I just want to say that they understood what was happening here. And yet Jesus continues to explain and make sure that they uh, understand. John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is to a broader group, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. 
we see that Jesus wanted his disciples. He wanted his followers. He wanted the people that were there on the earth and watching him at that time, and us too, to understand his purpose. He wanted them to understand the work that he was going to do. That This was not an accident. This was not something that was just, you know, popped up on the radar just recently and, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, I'm going to be nailed to a cross. I'm going to, you know, die on, die on Calvary. No, this was, this was something that he knew was coming. And this was another teaching time here at the Lord's Supper. He was telling them what was happening and what he wanted them to do in the future. I'll tell you that there are times that I don't do a good job of explaining what's happening. As a father, there are times that I'll be sitting underneath the car and uh, we were, this last week, we did an alignment job on the tires for our vehicle. And so I'm sitting underneath the tire or underneath the vehicle with the tie rod there. And, and uh, I, I tell Timothy, I said, Timothy, go get me the thing that does the, you know what? <laughs> and, and he said, the red, the red thing? The, you know, what, what thing are we talking about here? Which pliers am I supposed to go get? And, and I, had to, I had to be more specific. And what exactly I was talking about. And I think we all get that way sometimes in our speech where you know, we just expect that other people know what's happening. We had to be very careful with that as we go out and share the gospel, as we deal with more and more people in our society that are less and less familiar with the things of God, less and less familiar with the house of God and the way things are supposed to be. I think that I'm going to be teaching. There's so, so many things, I'll tell you, as a pastor, sometimes I look forward at the time, you know, I try to plan out my sermons. I have a, a list of, you know, what, I, what I'm preaching over time. And there are some things the Lord lays on my heart. And I say, you know, I need to get to that. I need to get to that. And there's only so many times that I have the opportunity to stand up and preach and teach. But I, I want to go through some of the church administrations, uh, the, just the things that we do here and why we do them. Why do we have a time for prayer at the end of every service? What is church membership and what is the scriptural case for it? When it comes to Sunday school, where is that in the Bible and why is that important? How do these things fit together in God's word? And I want to take some time to go through this because it's easy for us to say, I expect people to do what's right, but then as a pastor, I don't explain. I don't show people from God's word what needs to happen. A uh, pastor that I I know just, just locally even, you know, he, he did an excellent job. He, he would say, you need to cast the vision. You need to show people what it is. When you have an activity, you know, we had an activity for game night the other day. And um, Brother Peter uh, showed up and he said, I just had to come and see what was going on. <laughs> what is it when Baptists have a game night? Now, I don't know if he was expecting bingo. We were going to be giving out money or something. I don't know if he was expecting poker night or, you know, what the case is. But he came out because in some way he wanted to know because I hadn't told him well enough what was happening. And, and there are times that in our society today, we, we expect people to just understand. You know, there are times uh, in my gospel presentation where I say, you, you know what happened with you know, Adam and Eve in the garden. And they may not, but a lot of times they may not know. You may have to go back and tell them about what happened and how God created man perfect in his own image and he gave them the will and what happened and how Satan tempted and, and what that meant. And you may have to go back and explain those things that 30 years ago you didn't have to explain to as many people. When it comes to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, there are some times that I'll reference it from the pulpit and I'll, I'll glance on expecting people to understand and know what I'm talking about when it comes to Jesus Christ dying on the cross. But hey, Jesus in this situation, he took the time to teach his disciples. He taught them truth. He didn't leave them in the dark. He didn't just assume that they had all the information necessary. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I may know a truth, but need it to be reiterated to me. Am I the only one? I, I don't think so. I, I, there are times where it may not, it's not even because I've forgotten it. It's just because I need to be reminded of it. I need my wife. I listen to a lot of preaching through the week, and uh, I'll tell my wife about a message I listened to or something like that. I'll try to re-preach it to her, you know, and 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 I'll mention this, and you know, sometimes she'll say, "Hey, you know, what did the Lord do in your heart? What what happened here?" And the answer, simple answer is, you know, He just reiterated some things that were already there. He reminded me of truths that were already in my heart that I needed to stay firm and settled on. And Jesus Christ, He He gave them the information, the truth that was necessary. And the question is, are we looking to and listening to the truth that Jesus does give us? We understand that God's word is our, our direction, our guidance for all of life. It's not just how to have eternal life, how to you know, be saved, how to you know, make sure that our sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ. But more than that, it is how to walk 
in this life. I say more than that. There's nothing more than salvation, nothing you know, higher. But beyond that, he teaches us how to work. He teaches us how to interact with people around us, how to handle our finances and save and spend and not fall into scams and, and these sorts of things. He teaches us how to treat our animals. He teaches us how to eat in God's word, how to raise our children and how to worship and how to do all sorts of things in the word of God. But the question is, when he gives direction, when he gives us truth, when he gives us this commentary as he gave his disciples at the Lord's Supper, are we listening? The Lord's Supper was an opportunity for the brethren to be drawn together. It was an opportunity for Christ to show us his commitment. And it was an opportunity for Jesus to impart truth. As we're here this evening, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. The question is, will we let this draw us closer together as a church? Will we let this be a reminder and show us the commitment that Christ has to us? And will we listen to the truth that he has for us? With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray for a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to look back at your time with the disciples and the insight that we have from the account that comes from your word. I pray that you would please work in our hearts and our lives. I pray you would draw us closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a moment and go to the Lord in, in prayer and, and talk to him.